Welcome to Travels Through Time for an episode supported by the History Press. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're travelling back to the 17th century to witness a shipwreck that nearly changed the course of English history. On the morning of the 6th of May 1682, in unremarkable weather, the Gloucester, a ship of the Royal Navy, collided with a sandbank off the Norfolk coast. The wreck that followed was no ordinary one, for aboard was James, the Duke of York, heir to the English throne. Within hours of the collision, 200 people were dead. The wreck of the Gloucester has fallen strangely out of popular memory, but like the episode of the White Ship 500 years earlier, is a story that's full of drama, politics and personality. We have a fascinating guide to these events today, as well as writing books for the past half century. Nigel Pickford has been scouring the underwater world for historical shipwrecks. He's one of just a tiny few who aim to locate and explore the lost ships of our human past. As you'll hear, he's worked on many enthralling projects over the years, but the story of the Gloucester has captured his imagination as much as any of them. I spoke to Nigel, the author of Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester, just the other day. Well, Nigel Pickford, this is um, this is nice because for the first time in quite a long time, we're having an in-person conversation and um, it's very nice to be sitting in your very old cottage in Kent to record this episode. And um, we've got a tremendous story to talk about today, which we're going to get into in just a moment. But um, before we do, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, a little bit about yourself. I know that you have an interesting book before us, but you also have a very interesting job besides. And I wondered whether you can tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not writing books. Well, it's... Great to see you again, firstly, Peter. Well, I, I look for shipwrecks, old shipwrecks, um, but I look for them in archives. I do the research, um, which enables other people to then go and actually try and find them physically on the seabed. I mainly research high-value wrecks, or wrecks lost with high-value cargoes, I should say. If you were to start your hunt for a particular ship, Where's a good place to go? Um, There's all sorts of... Well, it depends on the ship you're you're looking for. I mean, actually, this week I have been working in the British Library um, in that bit of it which I particularly like, which is the uh, Asian Studies, which has the entire uh, India office collection, which is just wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, it goes back 400 years. Just uh, yesterday I was actually looking at company ledgers, and they're enormous. I could hardly lift them. Uh, You can't sit down and read them. I had to stand up because they're about one, at least 12 inches foot thick, deep, by about three foot by two foot. You know, they're enormous. Mm. Um, And what kind of, but like, just to um, hone in on this a little bit more, what kind of ships are you looking for? You said just a moment ago, that they are ships which are carrying high-value cargoes, which obviously is sensible because to make it worthwhile, you've got to, you know, kind of have some lure at the end to go to. But does this really mean ships from a particular century or a particular country that were on a particular trade route? Is there a particular kind of ship that you like to go looking for? Uh, Not really, no, because um, I've researched... Um, ships that have sunk as recently as the 1980s with a high value cargo. Um, lots of World War One, World War Two, big steel ships sank with uh, uh, gold, silver cargoes. And uh, sometimes it's not just gold and silver. Sometimes it's things like copper and tin, um, which make them attractive. Yeah, and also work on much earlier wrecks. I mean, the earliest wreck we found from research, which I did, um, was 1503. It's an early Portuguese wreck. We found it um, 
in the Indian Ocean. It was the wreck of uh, Vincent Sodre, Vasco da Gama's uncle. Yeah, very interesting wrecks. It's a wonderful picture of you sitting in the library, working through the ledges, trying to make sense of um, things that happened such a long time ago as 1503. How on earth did you start off doing something like that? It doesn't strike me as the kind of job that's suggested to you by a career officer when you leave university. What you know, what career path took you into this treasure hunting in the well, first place? Well, for me, it was very simple and straightforward because uh, my father was involved in looking, uh, well, researching shipwrecks and uh, working for again companies which looked for them and he the mystery because i don't understand how he he was working right from the 1930s um for salvage i don't know how, quite how he got involved because he left school at a very young age um but he did and uh, he was also in the salvage department of the admiralty during world war Two. he mainly concentrated on world war Two and world war one losses um, of which there are an awful lot then to be salvaged. Well, how well do we understand this underwater world? Is it still a completely uncharted continent full of delights to be discovered? Or in this age of a more precise technology, more advanced technology, presumably you can send cameras down and explore the sea seabeds and you'll have many more tools than perhaps your father had when he started out. Are we? Do we have a good idea about what's down there at the moment? Um, no, um, there's a huge amount down there which um, we know nothing about at all. What's really interesting, uh, even, you know, because I've been doing it um, since the uh, well, late 1960s, the technology has changed beyond all recognition. I mean, when I started, 800 feet was really deep. Now it's possible to look, we, you know, we've just... Uh, found a very interesting shipwreck in, in nearly um, 6,000 metres of depth. So, yeah, it's actually a very exciting time to be involved in shipwrecks at the moment because in the last 10 years, I think, the uh, ability to explore the ocean bed has changed out of all recognition. So what's the process then? So you do the archival work in the libraries, which is latterly passed on to others who then go out and do the active searching. Is that right? Yes, though it's not always quite as straightforward as that. Yes, I do do a lot of archival work, but I've got, it's kind of slightly more um, a reciprocal process because often um, you, you know, you know, there'll be, you'll know that we're working in a particular area, for instance, and therefore you're looking for ships of interest in that area because we might already have a lot of, um, technical stuff um, in that bit of the world, which um, it'd be useful to move on from one project to the next without traveling thousands and thousands of miles. Also, sometimes we you, you find, you know, there's a wreck that's found and it looks interesting and you've got to try and work out what it is. Um, and that, that, that can be quite good fun as well. If you're working the other way around, um, you know, you know, it's it might be Dutch, it might be seventeenth century, and then you you know roughly where it sank, and then you've got perhaps ten different candidates. You know, it's quite difficult to prove that you found the right wreck. So yeah. there's a lot of backwards and forwards the yeah, whole time. Yeah, because it's a, it's a simple premise that you find a shipwreck, then you go and investigate it. But as you suggest, there it becomes far more complex very quickly because I imagine you have to contend with um, I suppose this idea of uh, contradictory sources which might tell you different things oh, the practical problems of finding um, it in the first place but then subsequently even if you do find it even if you do work out what ship it was then surely then you have to enter another diplomatic world of well, what happens? Do you, do you have to, what, what's the legal status well, of shipwreck? For, for, firstly, sense? just to go back to the, the previous thing, yes, I mean, you, you, we know there's an interesting ship and now we can look in very large areas. So, you know, perhaps we're looking at 5,000 square miles of seabed. I mean, think there's an interesting ship in there. We might find a hundred targets 
you've then got to try and work out which is the right one mm. um, and narrow it down and identify it. Um, and sometimes, of course, you've, that's when you find something of interest, which isn't the one you're actually looking for. Um, so it can work that way around. Um, but to your other question, um, which is extremely complicated, OK, you found it. What's the legal situation? That depends entirely where you're working. Are you in international waters? Are you in territorial waters? Are you in someone's economic zone? Do you have a contract from the owner of the property that you're hoping to recover? It's actually a nightmare, <laughs> legally. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's particularly complicated today because um, there is a kind of, uh, you know, I mean, people would people who disagree with what I do would label me a treasure hunter. So that's a kind of a dirty word these days, treasure hunter. Um, didn't used to be. It used to be quite a, a well-respected profession. But um, there's a whole school of archaeologists, um, mainly coming out of the UNESCO current thinking, which believes that no shipwrecks should be touched. They should all be left under the water, um, and preserved under the water for this sort of mythical future generations, kind of ignores the fact that there's millions of shipwrecks out there, um, literally. And uh, some of them are high value. And if you don't do it within some sort of legal structure, you're just it, they will just get looted. Mm. And that's fishing. something that we've seen happen mm -hmm. many occasions. I know there's lots of um, especially on the west coast of Australia, there's lots of examples of shipwrecks from that early age of um, Indian Ocean mm. exploration, which have ended up, you know, kind of easy prey to people who were just profiteering. So that's a whole different part of a conversation we won't have today. I suppose that just adds that extra level of com complexity, which is you are sometimes dealing with, I suppose, grave sites in a way, aren't you? And when you yes. go down with your cameras to examine... There's got to be a kind of sense of trepidation to what you might see. Yeah, but there's actually, it, it, it's very rare to find a body on a ship, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, that that's not so, I mean, that's perhaps not true of the big steel wrecks. Mm -hmm. um, but of wooden wrecks, most bodies, most people have tried to get off. Yeah. And so their their bodies are quite some way away from the wreck itself. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find possessions, you'll find remains of the cargo and of the ship itself, but not usually bodies. I mean, it can happen. What wonders? Well, listen, I could, well, I'm going to talk to you more about that another time, but we do have a particular shipwreck we're going to talk about today, and we do have a format that we have to follow. So rather than airily wandering, wandering around the, uh, the sea floors of the world, let's get into it. And um, I'll begin this by asking you the question, that we ask of everyone that comes on this podcast, which is, if you could travel back through time, which year would you like to visit? Well, for me, it's 1682. Okay, um, well, let's start with a bit of broad history before we get more narrowly into the detail of what was happening back then. Why 1682? What was going on then that so demands our attention? Well, it's um, coming towards the end of the, the Stuart period. I think it's a, a fascinating uh, time of history. Um, there's the whole uh, Catholic issue, um, which is still very much to the fore. It's not just the, 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 the political revolution which was about to happen. Um, it's, you know, what's often called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Um, it's it's a period of this huge um, scientific interest, which really I find so fascinating. It's it's such a it's such a questioning era. Yeah, I think often when we think about data, well, this is how I think about it anyway. When you think about dating our modern world, often the restoration of Charles the second I get my Charles is right in, in um, 1660s is quite a nice place to start because of course then you have the Royal Society comes along mm. shortly afterwards the Royal Society of London who were kind of inquiring into um, scientific phenomena or natural phenomena as they would have put it 
back then. You've got the financial revolution, which comes along a little bit later in maybe the 1690s. You've got this... Um, Bank of England. The, that, yeah, yeah, the Bank of England and all that. And then there's the... Um, I, I suppose the drift away from religion is beginning, although it's not really completely underway, because you have still this great tension in England in particular between Catholicism and the Puritanism, which has so defined the period before when you had the Civil War and, and, and so on. But there's a sense that people are trying to get beyond that, um, which starts to emerge later in the 17th century. So it almost sounds like a cliche to say this is a time of change it's always a time of change but particularly around 1682 it's, it's a time of change and one of the other things that um that we've covered actually on this podcast um happened two years later which is an episode we did on 1684 with simon Schaffer at cambridge right. all about the um the genesis of the principia mathematica which of course is when newton for the first time started to explain how the planets were moving in the solar system, yeah. which um, completely and profoundly altered the way that people thought about the way life was. Um, so it's a really good choice, 1682. I want to also ask you a little bit about the cultural background, because when we think of Charles II, the I suppose the picture that a lot of people have in their minds is of the Merry Monarch, who comes back in the 1660s. There's a lot of the theatres open, people start having a good time. After the kind of hang-ups of the Civil War, there's a process, I would say, of letting your hair down. It's, it's, it's too easy a joke to make. But people, he seems to be synonymous with kind of this new breed of hedonism. There's lots of mistresses. He seems to go through them very quickly. And... Um, He's a gambling man. He's been described as a gambling man and he likes to go to the races at new markets and things like this, something mm. that he writes about in the book. But should we imagine this like restoration court as continuing to 1682 or has there been a slight change of mood um, throughout the course of his reign? Has the early exuberance kind of lost its lustre? I think it has a bit, yes. I think things are a little bit more sombre and, um, you know, it's not puritanical at all, but I just think there is um, probably anxieties which um, were, were coming back, <laughs> um, which perhaps were not there before. Mm. And the other character who is inevitable in this period, can't miss him, because he seems to be everywhere. And he's actually um, a character who appears on the front of your new book, Samuel Pepys, mm. um, exactly the same age as uh, James, Duke of York. We remember him today as the, the great Londoner, the great diarist, who seems almost omnipotent because he's everywhere. He sees the great fire, he chronicles the plague. He was actually at the execution of Charles I, if I remember correctly. Yes, um, He's going to pop up in this story very shortly, but um, I suppose by 1682, he must be quite elderly. Is that right? What's going on with people? Well, he, I suppose elderly in in terms of elderly in those days, I think he was late 40s. Um, so, uh, you know, he's really young, middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, he's... A man of considerable experience. Um, I mean, in 1682, he's he's lost his job. Um, he's he's a, he's a victim of of the fact he was very closely associated with James, and um, he's been a bit of a victim. That, that he's uh, this extraordinary. Um, you know, he he ends up put into the the tower for a bit because there's this totally false concocted story um, uh, put about about him. Um, so um, uh, Pepys, I think, is um, a good example of, of you know, the, how things were very complicated at this time. You had to be very careful. Mm. But of course, he's um, got to be a great source for you. I mean, I suppose his his great diaries relates to the 1660s. 
but he he does generate he, material. He goes on writing letters, which yeah. are fascinating. And of course, he's not. He, I mean, the diary is just amazing because it's just so revealing yeah. of, of the kind of the modern mind. Mm. But um, he's he's also this incredible administrator. I mean, you know, he he does run the navy in a, in a way that no one else has ever done, and uh, he has this extraordinary uh, mind and memory and uh, administrative ability. Mm. So hopefully we've covered the elements that set up the story which he's going to follow now. We have Samuel Pepys, not too old, forty, late 40s we'll say. We have James, the Duke of York, who is a politically divisive figure but is on the cusp of making a return. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, you have an elderly king and um, doubts about the succession. That's where we are in 1682. Yeah. Where would you like to go to for your first scene then? Give us a place to go to. Um, my first scene is the River Thames. Mm. And um, it's uh, early morning, 3rd of May. And it's we start at Putney, actually. And James has finally been told by Charles that he can go back to Scotland and fetch his wife, Mary of Medina, who is pregnant, back to London, and they will both um, be reinstated at the, at the centre of power. Mm. And uh, so there's this wonderful scene on the Thames when he sets out on the, in the royal barge, and uh, there's huge numbers of well-wishers, lots of small craft all around him, um, uh, going along, cheering, firecrackers being let off. It's actually better weather. It's been raining a lot, but it's better weather on this particular morning. And uh, The Stuarts weren't ones to do things by half, were they? They were great, like, kind of... Quite believer. flamboyant. <laughs> yeah, rather than believers in spectacle. I know um, there's this idea of the Thames pageant, which... Um, we did actually on one of the the Queen's jubilees. We did try and um, revive it about yes. ten years ago, and I yes. remember there was this picture of the uh, Prince Philip looking a bit miserable in yes. the rain, and it didn't quite yes. go to plan. But these were part of royal pageantry at the time, weren't they? The idea of starting off at Putney, which is towards the west of London, yeah. uh, where the, the boat race um, either starts or finishes—I can't remember—and then going right down through Westminster, past the city, mm. past the tower, in all pomp and circumstance. Is that what you're describing today? Is that what happened? Absolutely, yes. I mean, he, he, he goes, there were people crowding um, the, you know, the roof leads of, of Whitehall and Westminster. Uh, and and um, he, he goes along to massive cheering and um, it's quite a celebration. And uh, yeah, right through London, um, under London Bridge, which is quite dangerous, actually, um, because, you know, the water, water's really swirled and small rain boats often turned over at that point. Um, but he goes all the way to Erith in the, in the Royal Barge. And at Erith, um, the Royal Yacht, Mary, is waiting for him. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about James at this point, because I'm interested to learn bit more of your perspective about him as you were going through this research process and i know that you've written about this period before he's someone that you've uh, spent a, a few years with james duke of york are you um what's your impressions of him is he um someone who 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 you admire who you think is um i know there's this um great phrase of voltaire's later when he talks about james being someone who lost his throne in a matter that was hardly to be accounted for was he was he a frivolous character no, I don't think he was frivolous. He was rather serious. And he had many good qualities, I think. I think he he was very loyal to his friends and supporters. Um, he, he was very uh, open about his beliefs. Um, he, was, he was not um, vindictive. Um, he was a little bit limited in his thinking i think that was his great problem he wasn't this was a time when you you know you really needed to be subtle um and he wasn't he was just a bit 
you know, a bit too um, naive in some ways, I think. Mm -hmm. The River Thames must have looked exceptionally beautiful that morning. This is, as you write, with black gulls diving over the water, hundreds of oars plashing into the river, the white foam, the hundreds of sails fluttering on the small boats. Um, There's a phrase of Benjamin Franklin's that I always remember, which I think he said, there's nothing so uncommonly handsome as a full-bellied woman and a ship under full sail. So that idea of like... The, the two together. Yeah, well, maybe. But it's just that idea of the, the sails and, and the sights that really have been lost from the Thames today. If you go down yes. and see it today, you'll you'll see the Thames River cruisers, but they're not half of what that riverscape must have Absolutely been. Absolutely not, I'm afraid. I mean, if you're lucky, you'll see uh, an old Thames barge with its red sails, and mm. that's rather glorious even today. But um, no, I mean... All those sails, all those sailing boats, was just beautiful. Mm. Um, where were they going to? What was what was? I, you've, I think you told us the name of the royal barge, but where are they going to next? Well, they, uh, the the, um, the the royal barge um, ends up at Erith, and then they transfer to the the royal yacht Mary. Mm. Um, and um, there's so many people on the royal yacht that the captain is worried that the uh, the deck will fall in. Um, so many well wishes that have arrived there, and um, from there they they go on. Um, the the Royal Yacht Mary was going to go all the way to Edinburgh, but James wasn't going to go all the way on the Royal Yacht Mary. He was going to go down to Margate, um, and at Margate he rendezvous with uh, quite a large number of warships which have come all the way around from Portsmouth. Um, to join him there. So there's um, actually 10 ships in total, which are going just to get back Mary of Medina. Um, but of course it's not yet, you know, he wants to make a big show of it. And all his uh, most loyal friends, supporters, um, business acquaintance, all kinds of people have been invited along mm-hmm. um, with him. On, on this this sort of celebrationary voyage. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I suppose this is an important thing just to stress that he's going, he's taking a lot of the important people in English society along with him, including Pepys. We'll get to yes, Pe- Pepys has been invited and really the whole kind of point of the book really is, is Pepys being invited along and he's been asked more than once to go on the Gloucester, which is the um, the big warship that, that James is transferring to. And most of James's important supporters are also transferring to the Gloucester. That's where the big part is going to be. Um, so, you know, Churchill, for instance, future Duke of Marlborough, he joins him on the Gloucester. Um, there's important scientists on there, people like Charles Scarborough, they're, they're on, the, on, on the Gloucester. Um, and Pepys um, doesn't want to go on the Gloucester. He refuses. Um, mm. And that's, you just think, this is very unlike Pepys. Why is he refusing to go on the Gloucester, along with lots of people who he knows well? He's very close friends with Scarborough. Um, there's lots of musicians on board, including uh, a musician that um, Pepys is very close to, um, and you think, well, why, why, why doesn't he go along? Did you ever come to any conclusion about that? I do, yes. I think I do. Mm, okay, well, let's keep that in reserve <laughs> for a moment. Um, because the Gloucester is going to be our focus. Yes. Before we get to our next scene, just tell us a little bit about the Gloucester. You, you mentioned that it was um, a warship. I believe it's, by this point, it's 30 years old or so. It's seen action in Cromwell's Navy and the West Indies. It's a bit of an old bruiser, maybe. Is that a good description of it? Yeah, it is. It's um, it's a Commonwealth ship. It was built in 56, 1656. Um, um, but that's it's not alone in that. I mean, there's a, a number of ships in this particular fleet are of a similar age. Mm. Um, so that that's not unusual. Um, it's a beautiful ship. I mean, the... You know, these sailing ships had such ornate carving. Um, it was all 
it's not very grin, grinly Gibbons-ish. And um, they they were they were beautiful inside as well. I mean, uh, they uh, had wonderful painted interiors, um, lots of scenes, often of naval scenes, naval actions mm. uh, inside the ship. So they they were wonderful places. Well, it seems like a good place to leave that contained scene, this idea of the procession or the river pageant, the beginning of the process. Where would you like to take us to next, then, please? Well, it's um, it, we're in the middle of the North Sea. It's just a few days later. Um, it's the morning of the 6th of May, and uh, it's just past dawn. Um, it's a bit of a... It's it's not a scene that one would really go, I suppose, in some ways, go out of one's way to witness. But um, I, there's so many questions arise from this particular scene that if you actually got to observe it, um, it would be very interesting to answer because the Gloucester is about to hit a sandbank. And um, it's about to be wrecked and uh, there's going to be uh, there is there is a uh, nearly 200 people drowned significant loss of life uh, including many uh, of the notables guests who have been invited on board and um th- this this the shipwreck of the gloucester was to be a huge source of controversy throughout um well, for the several hundred years i mean winston churchill for instance writes about it and uh, many many historians have have written about it and it's always been a subject of great sort of partisanship you might say. Mm. I don't think it's something that we know about so much today which is obviously um, something that you're going to rectify with your book but could you give us um, a bit of an overview of where we are in the North Sea and um, so people can imagine where this scene is, is happening. It's early in the morning, you say? It's early in the morning. Um, it's um, about 30 miles from land and you've passed uh, Lowestoft the previous evening. The Lowestoft lights were seen the previous evening. Um, so you're up around the Humber, around the Wash almost. Mm. Um fairly near there so it's kind of right pretty mid north sea you might oh, say yeah. um and suddenly um the ship that's out in front which is the mary sees these breakers which is a obviously a worrying sign realizes it's sandbank um they wave a flag at the back trying to warn the gloucester which is following on behind but it's too late gloucester just plows straight into the sandbank Mm. Is it very quick? What what ensues afterwards? Yes. Well, this is one of the great controversies. Um, I mean, James received a lot of criticism after this wreck um, for um, dilly dallying. You know, it was said that he was uh, he he wasted a lot of time trying to get his strong box off um, when uh, if he just got into his little shallop. Um, which was there for him in case something went wrong um, and got off, then more people could have been saved because until he got off, no one else could get off. You know, so he had a lot of criticism for for dilly-dallying. I'm not so sure that's really fair. Um, he had to get some documents out of his strong box, which he did, um, but he didn't actually save his strong box. Um, and... Obviously, he thought it was important. I expect they were uh, official documents which he needed. The whole thing from beginning to end only took about 40 minutes um, before the Gloucester went down, from the striking to the, the Gloucester sinking. So it's, it but there's no, there's no um, obvious call. I mean, you say there's a sandbank there. They, they spot it. The Gloucester sails into it. But in terms of weather and... And, and other conditions which might have explained this. It's not they're not in the middle of a storm, for example. No, the it's... weather the weather was quite good. It, it was it was blowy. It was boisterous. Mm. Um, 
but um, the, the weather wasn't too bad, actually. Mm. Just a bit of um, maybe a topographical context for people who do not know this particular area um, of the world so well. The eastern coast of England was often sailed by the Collier Fleet, which would bring coal down to London. It was very well um, travelled in, in, in that way, but it wasn't very well charted. But people realised that there was a kind of a shallowness to the water and that there were many sandbanks around. This is kind of, is that a fair characterization of what people Yes, I mean, there's about? lots of sandbanks off, off Yarmouth mm. and... Um, there was much debate about um, it, it, there was much debate about the route mm. um, the Gloucester should have taken, mm. and um, the, the the Colliers, which you mentioned, they stayed very close to the coast and they went inside most of the sandbanks. Mm. Um, warships usually went outside the uh, the Yarmouth sandbanks, like the Newark Sand, but then cut in. Um, the Gloucester um, went was actually sailing the deep sea route, which was meant to be outside all of the sandbanks, mm. so a long way from land. Um, and so they were obviously thought they were t- on a course that would take them clear of this particular sandbank, which was called the Lehman and Ella. Mm. There's, well, we'll try and actually illustrate that on, on our website. I think that might be an interesting thing just to plot the different routes mm. around this area because it's it's integral to the story. But you said um, that it's not really a scene that you'd want to witness in some ways because it's a moment of great tragedy. Many people died. But if you were to witness it, you'd probably want to go into maybe a different ship, maybe with Samuel Pepys. So you could look at a distance and... Let's uh, let's assume the uh, the analytical eye of the historian, if we, as much as we can for that moment. What would you want to What would you want to know if you had the ability well, to look see, at that scene? J- going back to James, he was accused of dilly dallying, but he was also accused of only taking into his his shallop, um, his priests and his pet dogs. Um, well, uh, I, I'd quite like to have seen that for myself. I don't, I, you know, actually, if you actually look at all the historical evidence. Um, this seems extremely unlikely. Um, so this, could that just is, be anti-Catholic propaganda? I think it's just anti-Catholic propaganda because it, um, there are documents which make it clear that he had a pet dog on board called Mumper, but Mumper uh, had a struggle with Sir Charles Scarborough in the water um, to get hold of a plank and, and Mumper lost out. Probably difficult to grab a plank with paws. And... Um, <laughs> So Scarborough saw Mumper die uh, or drown. And um, so I, I think that's nonsense about the pet dogs. And there was only one priest on board who also ended up in the water. So I think it's fairly unlikely that any of that is true. Um, it was said that he could get 80 more people in his boat than he did. But actually, that's complete nonsense. Mm. So there was all these accusations which have been repeated for hundreds of years about James, um, James's behaviour at this moment of crisis, which uh, just don't really add up. Mm. But there, there was one very gruesome accusation, which I think was true um, because it, it crops up in a letter written by Sir James Dick, who was one of the people who was saved. Um, and that is that those who got into lifeboats or boats sent from other ships, there was a certain amount of cutting off the hands of people who were trying to also save themselves. People in the water, struck because there were hundreds of people in the water struggling to get into these boats. Um, the, uh, there were people uh, armed in the boats who deliberately cut off their hands because they were worried that the whole boat would be turned over if too many people got in and therefore everyone would drown. So um, Pepys also comments on this indirectly some years later uh, about how uh, gruesome a business this particular shipwreck was. Mm, and we know him to be quite an honest chronicler as well. Mm. He just wrote everything down generally as it happened, which is 
one of the amazing qualities of his writing. But you um, mentioned before that um, that Pepys is obviously there. Churchill is actually on the Gloucester. Mm. James, the Duke of York, is on the Gloucester. Um, Scarborough and Mumper. So we've got we've got a few characters that we, we, that we can place um, quite well. Um, but there's a tremendous loss of life. Did anyone die um, on that morning of great consequence? Or were the people who were lost generally the, the, the sailors? Well, the majority were sailors, but yes, there were. There were people like the Earl of Roxburgh. Um, he drowned um, and uh, left a widow, a young widow, who remained a widow for the next 71 years, I think it was. Um, there were a number of, uh, I think it was a, one of the um, the Clarendons who was um, an officer on board the ship, um, a young officer. He um, he drowned. Um, there were there were quite a lot of notables who also drowned. It wasn't a straightforward thing about just sailors drowning and all the all the notables mm -hmm. getting off. All the sailors uh, who were sort of clambering over the the side and and up on up the masts and things, um, threw off their hats and cheered because they'd seen that James was safe. Um, and then, you know, they sort of cheered three times, mm. who's our, who's our, who's our, or whatever. It's an and astonishing that, scene anyway, even that, if they weren't throwing their hats into the air. The, this picture of um, a warship carrying the air to the... English thrown at it, as it was at that point, um, foundering on a sandbank. It's strange that it's not quite so well known. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But there is, um, there's a picture of it, isn't there? Or a painting, I should say, more accurately, which which captures the moment. Yes, well, there, there's, there's a number of different paintings. And again, you, it's such a political time because um, there's, a, there's a wonderful painting by the Vandervelds, um, and they are clearly being commissioned by James himself to paint this very dramatic scene. And you can see the sun coming through the clouds and shining on James in his boat as he, you know, as the as the Gloucester's going down. In other words, it's it's all God's providence that James is saved. It's shining on peeps, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hello, Peter here. Today's episode is supported by The History Press, the United Kingdom's largest dedicated history publisher. As many of you will already know, The History Press has been publishing fascinating books like Nigel Pickford's for many years, and in no way are they confined to the 17th century world that we're talking about today. In fact, their books span all eras of the past, and forthcoming highlights include Dan Cohn Sherbrooke's Anti-Semitism, A World History of Prejudice, and the adventures of Arthur Conan Doyle, the real-life Sherlock Holmes by Christopher Sandford. Check out any or indeed all of these at www.thehistorypress.co.uk. Well, let's move to your third scene, which I know will give us a bit more elbow room for a bit of an analysis and interpretation of what happened. Um, so where would you like to go next for your third and final scene in 1682? Uh, it's uh, again on board a ship. Um, this time it's the Charlotte yacht, another royal yacht, and it's uh, moored up in Greenwich, just um, by the palace, by the, the wonderful white palace, which Charles II has, has rebuilt. Um, gleaming Portland stone it must have looked wonderful with the, the hill behind. Um, so that would have been lovely. It's a... I think it's June the 6th, um, it's miserable weather, it's raining. This is, this is the day when the, the pilot of, of, of the Gloucester, the man who was responsible for the, the navigation on board the Gloucester, um, who was immediately arrested after the sinking. Um, and he's been in Marshalsea prison and he's brought from Marshalsea Prison to the Charlotte <clears throat> yacht through crowded streets of people who all want to get to see him, and including lots of families of seamen who um, their loved ones have drowned um, on the Gloucester. 
Um, so he's brought to the Charlotte yacht for his court martial. Um, this is his trial. Is it and customary to have told these court martials on board a vessel? Yes. Yeah, absolutely required. So they all crowd in to the great cabin, uh, which wasn't that huge. Um, so it must have been pretty, uh, pretty fetid in there. Well, we'll let you in as well, because um, hopefully you can describe what's going on a bit more for us in a moment. But I imagine quite clearly this is a story of the hugest magnitude. The only equivalent I can think of which springs to mind is is one which happened many hundreds of years before with the white ship when the flower of England's nobility famously went down. Mm. Um, and we actually talked to, to Charles Spencer about that one um, about this time last year. So maybe this is our annual shipwreck. I don't know. <laughs> but um, that, of course, was a tremendous disaster because yes. it kind of wiped out so many people kind of get the sense that this is not quite as bad but it could have been i mean had james drowned yes. had churchill gone etc it probably would have been would have been equal you might say um so this is a, an enormous story uh, so a sense of shock must have permeated the whole atmosphere at the time yes so there was great, great expectation around this court martial james Ayres was the name of the pilot it's quite interesting because the um, the actual transcript of this court martial has disappeared from the National Archives. There were two court martials on board the the the, 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 the Charlotte yacht that day, and the other one you can still find. It was a court martial of uh, a sailor who accidentally set fire to a ship, and um, but this one has disappeared. So that's a shame because it would be which is why I'd, I'd like to go back to the actual mm. scene and listen to what was said. There was only one newspaper report, which I've managed to find, which just suggested that the only thing Ayers said was that the storms had moved the sandbank, and that's why they hit it. Um, that doesn't seem to be very plausible to well, me. Well, yeah. sandbanks don't move, actually. They or move about... Very slowly. Yeah, very, very slowly, geologically, kind of an inch a year or something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, that didn't stand up. Um, I don't know why he didn't say, well, look, um, the, the charts are completely inaccurate, which they were. I mean, the charts at the time were by someone called John Seller, and John Seller laid down the Alimina Moor sandbank about 14 miles from land. Mm. Well, they're actually about 30 miles from land. So the charts were hopeless. But no one seems to have bothered about the the inaccuracy of the charts. Um, no one seemed to bother that much about the fact that poor Ayres, he, he didn't actually make the crucial decisions about which way the Gloucester was sailing. Um, they were actually made um, by James himself. There'd been a huge argument about which way they should be sailing. Um, gunmen in the Mary Yacht... Um, insisted on a meeting the evening before. In fact, twice he insisted on discussions about which way they should be sailing. And it was James who had eventually resolved the conflict and said, look, let's just sail further out in that direction for another hour. Ayers hadn't even made the crucial decisions. Um, he was, however, sentence so to life in prison. Should we see him very much in the role of a fall guy? Is that what he was? Uh, I'm afraid so, yes, very much. Um, Does, so uh, he took the blame. Did James have any um, naval experience to... Because uh, you also write in the book a little bit about these, what you describe as gentleman captain, which is a slightly uh, disparaging tone for people maybe of... Um, because what I'm, I suppose I'm getting at here is on board a ship, there's a strict hierarchy mm. of um, decision making. Also, we know at this point in um, English society, it's an incredibly coded and stratified caste system which lies in place. Yes. 
So who makes a decision when you have James, Duke of York on board a ship? It's it's a conflict, isn't it? That's what I'm kind of getting at. Yes, it is. And, and, and I think one of the problems was James saw himself very much as a man of action. He saw himself as a, an admiral, as a soldier, um, as someone who'd fought the Dutch in, in, in those very, very bloody engagements like Sol Bay in 1672. And um, so... He, he was very happy to sort of take, you know, come forward and make the decisions. But no, he didn't have any uh, navigational expertise yeah. at all. Um, I think he just thought, to be fair to James, he thought he was playing safe by yeah. saying, go further out to sea. Mm. Um, uh, in fact, really, it was a muddle. Mm. You know, the, the whole navigation of that voyage was a total muddle. Um, I mean, the whole thing was a shambles from the start. I mean, three, three of the ten warships got lost on day one. Um, they misinterpreted a signal and uh, disappeared. And uh, I mean, you know, they turned up eventually, but um, they were detached from the fleet. So that it was pretty much a shambles, this great showpiece that James started with such splendour in yeah. Brittany has, has ended in such, I suppose, disgraceful scenes. Was it seen, um, well, first first of all, I'd best ask, um, where is James at this point? Is he in attendance at the court martial or no, is he up in not. Edinburgh? No. With he's Mary? not in attendance, but but Samuel Pepys is, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Pepys is there listening, uh, making notes, deciding what should be done. He makes lots of notes in, and, and uh, which have been preserved, actually. Um, about uh, you know how they've got to train pilots better, and uh, you know this is he's he's of course master of Trinity House a couple of times, and uh, he's this is a role for Trinity House, you know, mm. to to train pilots better, and he has all sorts of suggestions um, to avoid this problem in future. But you know, I, I, the point of my book, I, I don't want to give away the, the plot, but. It's that Pepys actually has real questions to answer, mm. um, which he, unlike Pepys, because he's usually very honest, I think, um, I think this th- there were things he just couldn't bring himself to think about, um, ab- about this particular event, and uh, I, which I find extraordinary, because he, he knew more about this than anyone. Mm. Mm. But he, he never he never comes clean. <laughs> wow. A few more questions then, which um, might help us to tie up the story. You describe at the, right at the beginning of the book, you open with a scene which is in the immediate aftermath of the wreck. And there's these bodies which are being washed up ashore, mm. which is um obvious sign to everyone that there's been some disaster. People don't know what it is yet. So there's a period of... Um, I suppose, working out what's going on. Mm. James eventually gets to um, Edinburgh. Is that right? Yes. But what becomes of the Gloucester? It goes to the bottom very quickly. You say about 40, 50 minutes from wrecking to sinking. Mm. And there, I presume, it remained for a long time. Indeed, yes. It remained until... um... Um, I've always been interested in this wreck, but I was talking to a group of um, amateur divers about it and who got very interested in it and um, decided they were going to look for it. They did. I mean, it had been looked for before, but it actually it had been looked for in what was obviously the wrong place. Um, if you if you studied Wet Wang's logbook, you, you, you could work out pretty much where the wreck was going to be. And so... Um, yeah, it took quite a lot of searching, but they did find the wreck and we managed to identify it from some wonderful artefacts that were um, brought up and, um, you know, enabled one to say, yes, this, this must be the right one. There's only one, you know, things. It, it was quite easy to identify it as um, an admiralty ship because of the broad arrow on things. Um, but there were two wrecks, um, Admiralty, you know, there was another one that was lost six years earlier. So it could have been that, it could have been the Kent. But then 
we uh, we found a, a teaspoon with a date on it, which meant that it couldn't be the Kent. It was just dated a few years afterwards. So, uh, what an ast- well, it's an extraordinary story because you began this by saying that I suppose your passion or your driving motivation in your work is to to find the story. Well, you can't find much more story attached to a wreck than than is attached to the Gloucester itself because you know who was on it, you know the chain of command, you know the historical significance in the context of the mm. voyage. Mm. So to put all of that together and then at the end of it to have the tangible kind of remains of, of that story is really quite special, isn't it? I think it is. I think it's very exciting. And I, I just hope that uh, one day a trust will be formed and, and um, you know, the, it will be properly excavated and the artefacts properly preserved and, and displayed, the interesting artefacts, because there's a huge amount of valuable artefacts down there on this particular wreck. Should we understand it now as being just there and in, in as as it was when you found it and as it has been throughout the 18th, 19th and 20th century? Is it just in a state of, I suppose, well, it, it, decay? It, it has the advantage that it's, it's a sand bank and, and a lot of it's covered by sand, which is very good at preserving artefacts. Um, uh, but, you know, it was nearly 15 years ago we found this wreck and word gets out and it's actually in quite shallow water um so word gets out and the, I, I i just don't understand this idea that it can be preserved in situ because what will happen is what i fear is already happening is it will be looted um and even if it isn't looted there are other dangers as well you know i mean there's there's pipelines everywhere, there's wind farms, there's deep sea trawling, which goes straight through wrecks. I mean, they, you know, deep sea trawling really does destroy shipwrecks. Mm. Uh, it's not very deep sea trawling, it's actually, it's fairly shallow water trawling. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of threats. So, you know, I just hope that um, it, one day it will be possible to, uh, to excavate it and uh, preserve the remains of it. It's a wonderful idea. It's a fascinating story. We're going to give you the opportunity to do a little bit of looting metaphorically as we come to the end of this conversation. Maybe you want Good. to take one thing. Is there anything, if you could have a tangible memento from this travel through the year 1682 that you would like to have as a talisman or a reminder or something? Yeah, well, I thought about this. I mean, I suppose one obvious item which people have always been interested in is James's strong box because there's always lots of rumours about, you know, it's full of jewels and so forth. And actually, after thinking about it, I rejected that. Um, I think what I'd really like is one of those wonderful wine bottles. There was an awful lot of bottles of wine on the ship. Uh, wine bottles were relatively new, and they're relatively new thing. They're those beautiful onion-shaped bottles it's a very sensible shape. It means they can't fall over when the when the ship is rolling around <laughs> on the waves. Um, so it's a very good shape for a, for a wine bottle. And um, they have these lovely glass crests on. Um, and the one that we, we did bring up, which helped identify it again, um, had a crest which um, showed... Uh, one of these cherub suns, flames going everywhere, and had initials RH on it. And um, it could be identified that this was actually the the symbol of the of, the, um, of a, a pub, which was called the um, the Sun, and um, it was situated in Fish Street, um, and uh, was owned by. Pepys' great friend, Anthony Dean. And uh, obviously Anthony Dean used to be the victualler for the Navy, so it's quite likely he was supplying wine for these ships. So, um, yeah, one of those. I, th- I think one of those bottles would be great. And the contents, of it might be quite a vintage by now. So. I, think, I think I might want to put to use it as a decanter <laughs> rather, rather than drink the wine, I not too sure about the quality after okay. 400 years. Well, it's it's something to leave us to ponder about. So Samuel Pepys and the strange wrecking of the Gloucester, a true restoration tragedy, is out just now. 
It's an absolutely fascinating dive into history. Nigel Pickford, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for coming on Travel Through Time. For for inviting me. Thank you. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Nigel Pickford about his absorbing new book. Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester is out right now from the History Press. And if you order it very soon, of course, it'll be with you in good time for Christmas. If you have enjoyed this trip into the 17th century with us today and you're eager for a little bit more than today, well, as a way of celebrating the fact that we've just gone past 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, we've also got a video episode for you. It's on the year 1666 in the Great Fire of London and it's with that wonderful broadcaster Dan Cruikshank. It's lots of fun and it can be found either by going to YouTube and searching for Travels Through Time or by going to our website itself, which is tttpodcast.com. If you have enjoyed this today, then please do consider leaving us a kind review on Apple Podcasts. It's a really nice way of helping us along. Otherwise, that's it for now. Till next time.